Hello everyone, welcome to episode 3 in my series A Beginner's Guide to Procedural Generation. Last episode, we explored what Perlin noise is and we learned how to displace our procedurally generated world by implementing it. This episode, we will be looking at how to store our generated cubes into a list and using that information to place objects into our world. Before we dive into the code, let's discuss and understand exactly what it is that we are trying to do. We now have a generating world that incorporates Perl and noise, but the cubes that make up the world are not accounted for. What we will be doing is adding those game objects into a list so that we have that information regarding these blocks stored and accessible. Once we have that data, we need to create a function that will give us a position of where to place these objects. Once we have the locations, we can go about implementing it and creating a restriction stating we can only have X amount spawned. Now that we understand what we are going to be doing, let's dive into the code and see how. Back where we left off in episode 2, the first thing that we're going to want to do is create a new game object which we will be passing in through our inspector. Now that we have our object, we need to actually go about creating this list that will hold all of our block information. Here we have created a list that holds type vector3 and we called it block positions. Now that we have a list, we actually need to populate this. We can do this by going into the start function where we are creating our block and just underneath that we can do block positions dot add and the blocks transform dot position. So what we're doing here is we are populating our block positions with the location of our created blocks. Now that we have populated block positions, we're going to want to utilize that information. The first thing that we want to do is create a method of type vector3 that returns a vector3. Now what we're going to want to do is create an integer that's a random index between the ranges of 0 and our block positions count. We created this integer random index in order to get a random location in our block positions that we will be using to spawn our new object. What we're going to want to do now is create a vector 3 that will be the new position of the objects that we're going to be spawning. Here we have created a new variable of type vector 3 called new pos. Like I mentioned in episode 1, whenever defining new vector 3s, we must provide the x, y, and z axes. What we're doing here is we are going into our list on a random location that we've specified, getting the x, y, and z axes of that location. We're adding to the y axes of that location because when spawning an object, it will take the center point of that position. Now that we have this new position, we're going to want to remove it from our block positions so we never have overlapping objects that spawn in the same location. Now that we've removed it, we need to return a vector3, so let's return our new pos. Great, now we have a location of where we're going to be spawning but we need to actually implement this, so let's create a new method of type void called spawn object. Within this method, we're going to be creating a new for loop that will loop until it hits a restriction that we mentioned earlier. What we are doing here is we're creating a new variable of type c, assigning it the value of 0, then we're stating if c is less than 20, we want C to increment. So any code that we put within this loop will loop round 20 times. Now that we have our for loop defined, let's put some code inside it to create our object. Within this code, we're creating a new variable of type game object called to place object. We then instantiate the object that we have assigned in our inspector. We are getting 
the random location and we are saying that we want the rotation to be the same of that as the object that we are spawning. But if we go and try to run this code now, it won't do anything because we're not actually telling start to call on it. So let's do that now. Now, if we take a look as to what's going on, step by step, we can see that first this loop is run, then this nested loop is run. We create the position, we instantiate the block, we add the block's position to our list of positions. Then we come out of the second loop. Then we come out of the first loop. And now we hit spawn object that creates these new blocks for us. The first thing that we want to do within Unity is create a new 3D object of type sphere. We want to change the scale of this sphere once we have that, we want to drag this into our prefabs folder. Once that's in our prefabs, we can go about deleting it in our hierarchy. In order to make these objects look more visible, I've created a material and attached it to our grid block. If we click on world controller, we will see that we have object to spawn missing. If we right click on this little circle, it will open up this. We don't have anything in our scene that we want to attach. So let's go into assets. Here we can see an object called sphere. If we click on that and exit out, we will see that we no longer have missing an object to spawn. Let's go about running our game. Here we can see that we are generating objects based on random positions on random cubes. We can do very interesting stuff with this, like generating terrain, adding in trees and rocks, generating buildings and placing them. But this will all be further discussed in later episodes. Thank you very much for joining me on episode three of my beginner's guide to procedural generation. I hope that this episode shared some insight into how to procedurally place objects on a procedurally generated world. There was a lot that was covered in this episode. So if you have any questions, please do leave them in the comments below. If you would like to do some further reading, I have included some resources in the description below.